Alfonso is with us this morning. He is the chaplain uh, for the New York Yankees and for the Brooklyn Nets. And he is a sports missionary. I asked Pastor Willie, I said, how did you, how did you get into this? How did you become the, are you wearing a Yankees jersey back there? <laughs> Our friend Freddie Caraprisi has got a, a Yankees jersey on. I, I, I said, Cha Chaplain, uh, how did you get into this ministry? And many years ago, um, Pastor Willie started a, an inner city sports program as a means of evangelism to young gang members. Uh, and it grew to several hundred young uh, boys, young men and women participating in sports programs, receiving the gospel of Christ. Out of that, they have sent dozens and dozens of kids to Bible college to study for the ministry. And from, amen, and from, from that inner city sports ministry, the Lord kept opening doors for him to become uh, chaplain uh, of the Yankees and of the Nets. He's wearing a World Series ring this morning. That's really cool. I, I know you all just got comfortable in your seats, but I want to ask, would you stand on your feet and would you give your best welcome for our friend, Chaplain Willie Alfonso. morning. It's good to be here. Rise and shine early in the morning all the way from Staten Island, New York. Now, I live in Staten Island, but I'm not from Staten Island. I'm a Brooklyn boy. We need to get that straight before we, we start. And it's good to see my good friend of many years, Alan Houston. Brother, it's good to see you, man. You and your family. I, I couldn't get over how big your kids are. Uh, I'm no longer chaplain with the Nets, uh, left the Nets two years ago, but I'm now, I've been with the Yankees for 26 years. Any Yankee fans here? I knew I was coming to the right church, Pastor. A any, any Met fans? Dear Lord, we just pray for them. God, we ask you to pull that Met demon out of them. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. I get in trouble doing that. If my wife was here, she'd be staring me down right now saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm, I've been with the Yankees 26 years. This is my 26th year with the New York Yankees and with the Staten Island Yankees, which is a, a minor league team over in Staten, Staten Island. Um, I'm married. My wife and I celebrated 49 years married. Can you imagine? One woman staying with me 49 years. I wouldn't stay with me 49 years. When we get to heaven, she's going to live in a mansion. I'm going to live in a project somewhere. You know, she stayed with me 49 years. We have three beautiful daughters. My oldest girl's 44. My second girl's 42. And then 15 years later, you know, God has a great sense of humor. He sent us another daughter, and so she's 28 years old. Praise God. We have two beautiful grandchildren. 13 and 9. Amen? Come on, say it like you mean it, amen? amen. Listen, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Pentecostal brother. I got to hear an amen now and then to know you guys are with me, amen? amen. I, I feel a little better now. I feel a little better. Like I said, I've been with the Yankees 26 years. Uh, I was with the Brooklyn Nets for 22 years. And I was with the New York Giants for seven years. Um, but, you know, it didn't start that way. You know, it's a, it's a great story to, to be with these teams and to go to all these World Series and Super Bowl and all, all that great stuff. But it didn't, start, it didn't start that way. Like I said, I'm a Brooklyn boy, raised in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, there's seven kids, my mom, my dad. And my father was probably the most evilest man that ever walked the face of this earth. My, my father used to beat my mom every single day, every day. My father would beat us every single day. He was a cook, so he had these big iron spoons, and he would come in drunk, and he would beat the living daylight out of us. My brother Andy and I, we would put our bureau against the door to our room and put empty cans of Coca-Cola and 7-Up 
So if he tried to get in the middle of the night to hurt us and we were asleep, those cans would fall and would wake us up. That was our alarm so we could run out. Now, you know, I used to always say to myself, one day I'm going to grow up and I'm going to man up. I'm going to take care of this dude when he rolls up on my mom to hit her. I remember the first time I said that to myself, I was around maybe five or six years old. At seven, I said it again. At eight, nine, ten, I said it again. And around almost 11 years old, my father had walked in, and he went to hit my mother with a broom, and that day came. And I hit him, and he fell. Now, let me say this before I continue the story. Because I, I, I said this in another church, and after service, this brother came down and told me, thank you, Pastor Willie, I'm going to go home and take care of business. <laughs> and I said, you missed the service, you missed the message, brother, because I see you in prison, I, I do prison ministry, you know. That's not what I'm saying, I, you know, that's not the right way to take care of it, but that's, that's what I did. And so he fell down, he ran out, and I want to tell you something, that that day was the best day of my life. I felt for the first time that I was safe. I felt for the first time that there was peace in my home. And one day went by, two days went by, but on the third day, my father called my mother, said he was coming back home under one condition. I had to go. So at 11 years old, my mother and father threw me in the street. And I lived homeless in the streets of Brooklyn, eating out of garbage cans, living in abandoned buildings, Waking up in the morning because rats were biting my feet. Started sniffing glue, started sniffing cabana, started smoking pot. Started doing LSD, started doing heroin, started doing heroin and cocaine. And for almost 18 years of my life, that's, that's what I did. Trying to get this habit off my back. I would, be cl I would get clean for six months, go back, I get clean for a year. I go back, I get clean for eight months, I go back. And it was just back and forth, back and forth. I had gotten married, started having children. I never went to school. I didn't know how to read. I didn't know how to write. And one day, a friend of mine got me a job in a print shop. I worked in this print shop. There were over 60 employees, all black and Hispanic employees. And one day, they hired this guy, a blonde haired blue eyed white guy. And the first thing he did when he saw me, he rolled up on me and he shook my hand and told me that Jesus loved me and he opened up his Bible and he read a verse. And I said, man, this is some crazy white boy, man. You, you ever meet some of these Christians with that stupid smile? Always telling you Jesus loves you? Some of y'all got that smile, right? Now I can see it from here. So, his name was Otto Lang, and every morning Otto Lang would roll up on me, tell me Jesus loved me, open up his Bible, and read me a verse. And after a while, it got kind of annoying. Remember when someone was witnessing to you? After a while, it got annoying. So I took his Bible, and I took it to a glue machine, and I glued his Bible. I said, this dude ain't opened up no Bible today. He ain't reading me no verse. And Otto saw his Bible all glued up, and he went to the cutter, and he cut the glue off, came to me, told me Jesus loved me, opened up his Bible, and read me a verse. This, this crazy white dude, this crazy German man, blonde hair, blue-eyed German man, had the audacity to start a Bible study in our print shop. So I would go into that room a minute before Bible study and light up two or three joints and I smoked the place up. I said, if he's going to talk about Jesus, we all getting high. And Otto would try to hold his breath and he would come in and he would tell us about Christ. It's amazing. See, Otto Lang was not intimidated whatsoever by these 60 black and Hispanic brothers. He knew who he was. He knew that God had given him a mission. 
So he wasn't intimidated. I was more intimidated by him than he was of me. Make a long story short, I had gotten strung out. My wife was about to leave me. Spoke to Otto. He brought me to church. And I sat all the way in the back. And I heard this preacher preach about Christ. And I made a deal with God. You ever make a deal with God? See, God could handle any deal you make with him. Any deal you make with God, he could handle it. As a matter of fact, when I made this deal with him, every other word out of my mouth was a curse. God could handle any deal you make with him, even if you're cursing. Now, I know better now. I wouldn't speak to God that way now. But back then, and I said, listen, God, Jesus, Whatever your name is. Personally, I think you're a hustle. But if you are who you say you are, and you could do what people say you could do, and you could get this habit off my back, and my wife doesn't leave me, nobody will serve you like me. So, Pastor finished his message, Pastor. He made an altar call, and I got up, and I walked down that aisle, and I came to the front, and I gave my life to the Lord, and we're going on almost 40 years ago. I've been clean for 40 years. I have never, ever, never, ever <laughs> taken drugs again. Never. Not one time. And I started this journey with God. But I had a problem. My pastor wanted me to get baptized. But when I looked in the room where they were having the baptism classes, I noticed that people were reading from this little book, a baptism book. I was 27 years old. I couldn't read two words. So I told him, mm -mm, I'm not going in there and be embarrassed. So the pastor had a retired teacher Angelica Valentine, she tutored me for three years. Every Tuesday and every Thursday, I would go to a house and I would sit there and I would read See Sally Run. I can't tell you how humiliating that was. And she used to say to me, you have to look at it like you have this little ax and you got this big tree in front of you and you just need to start chopping away and just keep chopping away. Sooner or later, you'll get through. So I started chopping away. I took the GED test six times. They knew me up in there. I would show up and say, oh, Mr. Alfonso, you back. And, yeah, I'm back. What is, is there a problem here? You got nothing but a bunch of haters, man. Yeah, I'm back. Man. I passed the GED test by two points. That's the beauty in passing the GED test by two points. The beauty is that all you need to do is pass it by one. See, that's like when the Yankees beat the Mets. It don't make no difference if we beat them by two, by ten, or by one. We beat them. <laughs> Sorry, Mets fans. <laughs> I had to throw that in, man. <laughs> it makes no difference. I went on this journey with God. I went on this journey with God. And I started learning that greater was he that was in me. And he that was in the world. I started learning that I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me, man. My father used to call me Silvenwensa. You know, it's a Spanish word. Say, oh, tu Silvenwensa. You're never going to amount to nothing, man. But I, started, but I started learning that I was special. Created by God to do something special for him that only I could do. Nobody else could do it but me. I don't know about you. But I'm a special brother, man. I'm as special as they get. 
I'm on this journey with God, man. You know, I'm one of those hallelujahs, one of those, you know, Bible thumpers, one of those, you know, all those names we get, man. I used to tell people all the time when they were Christian, try to tell me about Jesus, get out of here, hallelujah. I'm one of them now. I'm on this journey with God. I'm on this journey with God. And greater is he that is in me that's in the world. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not some things, but all things I could do. See, my father, my great-grandfather was an alcoholic. My grandfather was an alcoholic. My father was an alcoholic, and I became a junkie. See, when the Bible talks about that family curse, it's real. It's real. That's just not no fable. It's real. Be careful what you do. Be careful what you get into. Be good. You're going to travel that down to your children, to your grandchildren. Here in, uh, in Joel 2.25, when we come to Christ, this is what he tells us, I would repay you for the years that the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts. All the years that the locusts have eaten for my family from generation to generation, God says, you give your life to me. And that curse will be broken. See, because that's really what we are. We're curse breakers. Come on. We're curse breakers. Amen? We are, we're curse breakers. In Galatians 3.13, it says that Christ became the curse for us. All of our sins, generationally, past, present, and future, will nail on that cross. That's what we are. See, there was a time they used to walk around, people say, there goes Martha's son, the junkie. Because I would rob you blind. I would snatch your pocketbook. I would snatch your chain. I would do whatever I had to do to get high. It made no difference. So I started this journey with God. So my wife and I were in the church. A week after I got saved, my wife came to midweek service and she got saved. Because when I got saved and I went home, I told my wife I gave my life to Jesus. She said, yeah. <laughs> I don't know where you went and got that drug, but it's good. You didn't get beat this time. That's some good stuff. You did what? You gave your life to who? Who you, Jesus? I had family members that didn't believe I was saved until maybe three or four years after I got saved. They were waiting for me to say, I was kidding. And in one week, my wife saw how I had changed. So she came to midweek service, and she gave her life to the Lord. Amen? And then after baptism, we got involved in our church. I couldn't read or write. We started teaching elementary school. So she would do the reading, and I was the clown. You know? <laughs> then we started teaching junior high school. Then we started teaching high school. Then I started doing prison ministry. I was an usher. Let me tell you something. There's never been a time in almost my 40 years of being saved that I had not served in my church. I want to say that. I want to say that, man. And I know maybe some of you get a little mad because I'm going to say it, but the truth is I don't really care because I'm not the pastor here. I can say whatever I want, and if you don't like it, I don't care. I'm getting in my car. I'm leaving. <laughs> you get ticked off all you want. Makes me no never mind. There's never been a time that my wife and I, in whatever church we were in, did not serve. God did not call you. God did not call me to come to church and sit. Didn't. He didn't. There are gifts and there are talents in this church that if you would fan the flame of your gift, poof. When did I ever imagine in my wildest dream that I would be chaplain to the New York Yankees? That's crazy. Not on my best day could I have put that together. It's a Jesus thing. 
as much as I love, look, I like baseball, but I love basketball. I mean, I'm a basketball nut. And I would serve as a chaplain to an NBA team and be around NBA players and guys like Brother Allen. Man, that's crazy. That's insane. Now, I was never a Nick fan. I was never a Knicks fan growing up. I was, never, I was always a Laker fan. Magic Johnson, Kareem, you know, that was my team. But think about it. Ex-junkie, flying, in World Series, went to two NBA championships with Jason Kidd and Byron Scott. It's crazy. Only Christ could do that. On my best day, I couldn't put that together. On my best day, I couldn't put that together. It's Christ. It's the Christ that lives in us, man. And what he's done for me and how, how he's used me, he can't wait to use you. You just get, got to get off your backside and start serving God. Amen. Now, the pastor didn't tell me to say that. <laughs> but I need to hook the brother up. I need, because I know, I know, I'm a church guy. I know how it rolls. Could you imagine if every single person in this room decided to fan the flame of the gift that was in them? There wouldn't be a, you have to rebuild. all have a responsibility to see others come to the Lord. I'm so grateful that that crazy, blonde hair, blue-eyed white boy decided to come after me. Yeah. Otto Lang became the father that I never had. I just had to teach him how to eat rice and beans. Because, <laughs> you know, he ate knockwash and sauerkraut. We don't eat that. Puerto Ricans, we don't eat that. We eat pork, you know. <laughs> you feel me, brother? Huh? We, 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 we swine, we eat pork. <laughs> we eat rice and beans. I got to have rice and beans at least three times a week. Otherwise, something ain't right. We need to stir up the gift that's in us, man. Anybody here like chocolate milk? I love chocolate milk. I mean, I'm a chocolate milk junkie. I say that clean. <laughs> After I said it, I said I shouldn't have put it that way, but too late. Right? If you want a glass of chocolate milk, you get a glass of milk, right? Come on, you with me, right? Yes. Now, I'm from New York, and in New York, the chocolate we drink is Bosco. Okay, that's what we drink in New York. I don't know what you're drinking in Connecticut, but in New York, we drink Bosco. I love Bosco so much, I named my dog Bosco. <laughs> right? So you get a glass of milk and a glass of what? Bosco. You put the Bosco in, now you drink it, right? No, you got to do what? You got to stir it up, now you drink it, right? No. You got to look at the bottom, make sure you got it all. <laughs> right? And that's what God is saying, stir up the gift that's in you. Stir it all up, man. Stir it up, stir it up, stir it up. And if you do that, there are no limits to how God will use you. There's no limits to how God will use you. It makes no difference if you're white, black, Hispanic, or whatever have you. You're special. See, I'm a special dude, man. Well, that's arrogance. Okay. Fine. It's arrogance. You're bragging. I am. I'm bragging on what God could do. I'm bragging. Imagine I'm working now with ministering with the NBA and Major League Baseball. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing a Bible study one-on-one -on -one with Mariano Rivera, the greatest relief pitcher ever in the history of baseball. 18 years. I would go to his house every other week and we will be in his office doing a Bible study, ex-junkie. I remember after five years of getting to know him real well, 
I said to him, hey, Mo, say thank you, Jesus. He said, why? I said, because I asked you. Say thank you, Jesus. He said, yeah, but why? I said, because I asked you, brother. Just say thank you, Jesus. He said, okay, thank you, Jesus. Why? I said, thank you, Jesus, that I'm saved. Because when I was a junkie, I would have robbed you blind, brother. <laughs> I said, you got some good stuff in this house, man. <laughs> Yo, there ain't nothing here you bought in John's bargain store. This, this is money. You know, so thank you, Jesus, I'm saved, man, because I would have rolled a truck, cleaned you out. Cleaned you out. His kids call me Uncle Willie. My kids call him Uncle Mo. Could you imagine a guy that was abused, a guy that was stabbed by his father, a guy that was beaten with a spoon, a guy that ate out of garbage can, a guy that lived in an abandoned building and woke up in the morning because rats were biting his feet, that God will turn him around and use him and put him in the house of the greatest relief pitcher ever in the history of baseball. That's crazy. That's God. That's God. And what he's done for me, he wants to do for you. You just got to get with his program. You just got to get with his program. It starts here in this house with this pastor and this leadership. There are gifts here that need to be used to enhance the kingdom of God. I'm just saying. What are you saying? Had a, a, a player, Alonzo Morning, came to the Nets from Miami. I remember the first time I, went, <laughs> I introduced myself to Alonzo. I went up to him in the locker, and I went, took out my hand. I said, Mr. Morning, my name is Pastor William, the chaplain here. You know, welcome to Jersey. Back then we were in Jersey. And that brother was taller than me sitting. <laughs> that was a big brother, man. Zoe was a big brother. We called him Zoe, right? And so I took my hand out, and he just picked up his head. He said, hmm. And when a six foot ten brother go, hmm, leave that brother alone. <laughs> you leave that brother alone, man. All right? Though it's old school, you know. And so I came the next game, same thing, and he said, hmm. I left him alone. Now, I, you, you know, notice I have a lot of energy, so I don't sit during the game. I had the spot where I always stand. And when I went to the spot, there was a guy standing on my spot. And I said, man, who's this dude sitting, standing in my spot? And he was Alonzo's bodyguard. We got to know each other. I helped him walk through some issues. And then one day, Alonzo morning, his kidneys broke down, and he almost died. And his cousin gave him a kidney. He went to the hospital, had a kidney transplant. And at 5 in the morning, the Lord woke me up and told me, go to the hospital and visit Alonzo morning. I said, you know, Lord, the brother goes, hmm. <laughs> brother says, hmm. But I went, right? Now I'm thinking the whole way there, how am I going to get in? You just can't see a the morning. Went there, went upstairs, and guess who was deciding who saw Alonzo and who didn't? Body God. See, the Lord has set it up already. He said, oh, Pastor Willie, go right in. I won't let nobody in. How much time you need? <laughs> Walked in. Alonzo was in the bed. He said, Pastor Willie, how you doing? He smiled. I got ticked off. I said, yo, my man, I guess it's something about almost dying, and now you don't mind seeing the pastor, huh? Hmm, to you. <laughs> and we got to talking, and then I was leaving. I turned around, and I pointed to I said, Zoe, let me ask you a question. What are you going to do about Jesus? And he said, man, I don't know, Pastor Willie. I've done so many things. So I sat down, I shared my story with him, and right there he gave his life to the Lord. And he left, he left, he left the Nets, went back to Miami, and when they went to the championship, he flew me and my wife out to be there the day he won the championship. We're in my wildest dream. Then he wrote a book, and if you buy his book, you go to chapter 10, it's all about our friendship and how I led him to Christ. How my craziest dream, Pastor. Then he got inducted to the Hall of Fame. And during his exception speech, pointed me out in front of all these cameras, in front of the commission. Where in my wildest imagination when I was shooting dope did I think that that would happen? But that's God. That's God. And see, he doesn't do this just for Willie Alfonso. 
That's not the way he operates, man. He does it for you and 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 you and you and you and you and everybody back there and everybody over there and everybody back there. You just got to get with this program. See, I told the Lord when I walked down that aisle, if you could get this habit off my back, nobody will serve you like me. Listen, this may sound arrogant, but be it as it may, ain't no one serves God like me. I'm serious about serving God. I'm a hallelujah. Straight up, holy roller. Straight up. That God would take a guy like me, Puerto Rican boy from Brooklyn, from Bedford Stuyvesant, and use him the way he's using me. Only God. Only God. But it's a journey. It's a journey. You know, I'm personally sick and tired of these preachers preaching, come on to Jesus, everything's going to be all right. That's a lie. Now, I'd rather go through what I'm going through with Christ than by myself. Don't get it twisted. You come on to Jesus, everything is not going to be all right. There are going to be trials, there are going to be tribulations, all kind of stuff is going to happen, man. But like I said, greater is he that is in me. My father and mother, they got divorced. My father remarried this Philippine girl. because My father was a merchant seaman. He bought this Philippine girl from the Philippines. And guess what he did? He beat the living daylight out of her also. They had a daughter. I had a sister. I didn't even know. He beat that girl so bad that the state took her away. So one day, I'm a pastor, right? The little Holy Ghost, I get a call from my mother, and she says, your father, my father lived up in Spanish Harlem, was opening up a window because there was too much heat given in his apartment, and he had an aneurysm burst in his brain, and he fell out with his face and his shoulder on the radiator, and he was there burning three days. I'm a pastor, right? And I answered my mom in a real spiritual way. I said, why are you calling me? I couldn't care less. I hope he drops dead. I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. I hope he drops dead. When she said his name, every bit of anger that had been building up in my heart for years for what this man had done to me and to my family. Just rose up in me, man. It was deep. I hope he dropped dead. Boom. Hung up the phone. And God started speaking to me. Yo, go to the hospital. I ain't going nowhere, God. I said, Lord, you're going to lose this one. You're going to lose this argument. But I ain't going nowhere. Yo, all you going. Yo, all you going. You know I went. I get to the hospital. See, you know, this name pastor, reverend, chaplain, it don't help me none. I get mad just like you. I hurt just like you. I tell you what, hit my brand new car on the way out. You meet a different Pastor Willie. <laughs> Go ahead, hit my new ride on the way out. See if I'm going to be full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I'm just saying, guys, look, there's no halo on my head. There's no wings on my back. I'm dealing with this just like you. I'm dealing with pain just like you. I'm dealing with dis disappointments just like you. I hope he drops dead. So I get to the hospital. When I get there, I run into my oldest brother, Andy, and my, my baby sister, Carrie. And we went upstairs, walked into the room. And for the first time in almost 25 or 20-something years, I'm staring at this dude, man. I'm staring at this man that beat the living dead ass out of me, that stabbed me, that made me eat out of garbage cans, that made me live in abandoned buildings. I'm staring at this guy. And I feel God say to me, I want you to tell him about me. I said, I ain't telling him nothing. A matter of fact, what I'd like you to do is to cut every tree, send it down to hell, 
and put it in the fire so when that chump gets there, he could burn. The pastor. Keeping it real. If you're looking for a theologian, maybe he's coming next week. <laughs> Not me. And God said, that hell you want your father to go to, you will go in there also, but you're not because of me. So I, I rolled up on him, and I said, listen, Hop, all these things that's happened, I forgive you. And I'd like for you to get right with God. So I prayed a prayer, and I said, if you want to give your life to Jesus, but he fell in a coma again. Move your head, move your hand, move something. And he moved his hand. And, and six hours later, he died. So my brothers and sisters got together. And I said to them, I would like to bury that man with the dignity he never gave us. See, this thing about forgiveness, <laughs> it's not for that person. It's for you. It's to free you. It's to free you. See, a lot of us, man, we're walking around ticked off. We're walking around. And listen, I'm not undermining your hurt. I'm not believing, man. No way, no how. It's real. It's real. But if you want to get to a place that God wants you to get to, you're going to have to take care of that junk. You got to take care of that junk, man. Listen, man, I was telling Pastor in the office, I hate telling this story. I hate telling this story. I hate telling this story. But I know it's going to bring healing to some of you guys, so I say it. I don't like going down memory lane. But I know that some of you guys are trapped. You're in neutral. Where do you go in neutral? Nowhere. You know, after I forgave him and we buried him, three months later, I felt like God had taken my hand and knocked it into first. And that's when sports ministry opened up for me. Forgiveness is not for that person. Well, if I forgive him, then he's going to think I'm a punk. Not for that person. For you. It's to free you. It's to enable God to use those gifts and those talents you have in you, brother. That's what it's for. It's not for that person. It's not. It's for you. I'm not going back to that old world. Are you crazy, man? My teeth were all rotted from the quinine of the heroin. See all these teeth? Implants. They're all mine. I will go without bathing for a month. Honestly. Brother look good, right? <laughs> uh, so I, I turn around, I get a different profile. <laughs> Brother look good. Look, look what God does. Look what God does. Look at his handiwork. I should be dead or dying of AIDS, or doing life in jail. I'm here preaching in your church this morning. Through the grace of God. <laughs> Bringing you a message of freedom. Of freedom. Guys, God wants to use you. But we come to the Lord with this luggage we come into this journey with this luggage, and we got to take that suitcase of junk, open it up, and start unwrapping some of that stuff, man. That's why it's important that if you have a prayer meeting in this church, that you're there. That's why it's important if you have a men's group, that you're there. That's why it's important. See, I learned all this stuff. No one taught me how to be a father. No one taught me how to be a husband. I learned all that stuff in church. Other men that God put in my life that helped me. I learned that in church. I learned that being around. Listen, I don't hang around nobody that wants to hang out. I don't. 
I don't. I got three best friends. All three of them are married. All three of them love their wife. All three of them love their children. And if one of them were to leave his wife, boom. I mean, I'd, I'd be his friend, but I'm not going down that road. I'm not going down that road. 49 years married. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy, man. And I'm by far more in love with my wife today than when I married her. She's this short little Puerto Rican girl. No, she's, let me tell you. This, let me, this girl, she, she's fine, man. <laughs> oh, my, my woman, she's fine. She's fine, man. I'm going to go out there and try and mess with her. I can't handle her. My woman, she's fine, man. I've been going to Tampa for 26 years to spring training. I could stay in the best hotel in Tampa. I could stay in the best hotel in Tampa, spring training. And you know where? I, I've never stayed in those hotels. Not one time, Pastor. When I do what I do and I finish, guess what I do? I get in my car and I drive all the way to Ocala, an hour and a half. I stay with my brother. I'm safe. See that pastor, reverend, chaplain? <clears throat> Don't help me none. Those girls look fine to me too. <laughs> I'm not getting caught up in that, man. I'm not going to allow the devil to rob what God has given me. I'm not going to go home and have to explain to my wife that I went to Tampa and got me a little something, something, and messed up 49 years of marriage. I'm not facing my three daughters and have to explain to them how I cheated on their mom. I'm not facing my granddaughter and my grandson to explain I cheated on grandma. I'm not having your pastor tell me we can't invite you back because you can't keep it right. Just saying. Pastor, Reverend Chaplain, don't help me none. I'm dealing with the same stuff you're dealing with every single day. That's my message to you. That's my message to you. Greater is he that is in you than he's in the world. You could do all things to Christ who stuff in you. This is a beautiful sanctuary. My God, man, you guys did it right. Man, you all hooked it up. <laughs> you all hooked it up, man. But now what? Now what? Now what? You, you sit on your backside and do nothing? No, this church needs more ushers. They need more Sunday school teachers. They need some of y'all that... Uh, a gifted in music to be up here doing some worship. We need some Sunday school teachers instead of the same Sunday school teacher for the last 10 years being Sunday school teachers. Amen. Yeah, I said it. I said it. Like I said, I don't really care. <laughs> After the next service, I'm going home. <laughs> I'll get mad all you want. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. Because you don't know I'm saying the truth. We all have a responsibility to the kingdom. All of us. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you. You musicians could come up. We thank you, almighty God. We come to church this morning with a heart full of thanksgiving. Saying thank you what you've done in my life and the lives of many that are here. Thank you, Lord God. Hey, you know, there's a whole lot of things I know about you, God. There's some things I don't know about you. There's some things I don't understand about you. But there's this one thing among other things that I'm very certain about you, and that's that you're a good God. That you're good. That you're good. And maybe, just maybe, there's someone out here sitting today that don't know you in a personal way. And today is your day. The Bible says the day of salvation is today. It's now. Tomorrow is not promised. I want to get in my car and drive back to Staten Island. That's not promised. This could be my last day. So if that's you, and you've never given your life to Christ, this is your day. Just in the quietness of your seat, you could talk to God right where you are and say to him, Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Go ahead, talk to him. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that you went to the cross for me. Go ahead, talk to him. 
past, present, and future sins. For me, talk to him this morning. And Lord, would you forgive me and come into my heart? And what you've done for Pastor Willie and for many others, could you do for me? No one will serve you like me. And if that's you this morning and you prayed that prayer, would you raise a hand so I could pray for you? Anybody? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Anybody else? This is it, man. This is, this is, amen, brother. This is your moment. Don't let the enemy rob you. Imagine almost 40 years ago when I stood in the back of that church, had I not raised my hand, I would be dead or dying of AIDS somewhere or doing life in jail. Anybody else will raise a hand and say, that's me? Praise God, brother. I see your hand. Praise God. Amen. 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 I want those of you to raise your hand at the end of the service. I want you to come up here and speak to the pastor or to the leaders of this church. Please don't walk out without doing that. Because if you lift your hand and do nothing else, that's all you did was raise your hand. And start this journey with God. Hallelujah. Praise the living God. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah, man, before I burst. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Pastor, thank you.